thank you, Bob, and, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I've been a professor now for, I think, almost 30 years, so I know how to convey my voice. So if you do not hear me, please just wave back there, but I suspect that uh, my voice does carry. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is climate change and transportation and the relationship between the two uh, from two different perspectives. I call it cause and effect challenges. Uh, and by cause, I mean the transportation sector is a source of emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, and what that means in terms of public policy and what we as transportation engineers and planners have to deal with. And then the effect is climate is changing whether you like it or not. Uh, and what does that mean in terms of the transportation system in particular, often referred to uh, as adaptation. Um, there are other terms that are used now nationally. Uh, one refers to mitigation uh, with regard to how are we going to mitigate the effect of the transportation sector, i.e. how are we going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that come from the transportation sector. That's referred to as mitigation. And then, as I mentioned before, given the fact that climate is changing uh, and that could have significant effect in terms of how our transportation systems are designed, operated, maintained, et cetera, how are we going to adapt to those changes over the longer term where we're talking 40, 50, 60 years? And that's referred to as adaptation. So when I refer to the word mitigation, I'm talking about the source. When I'm referring to adaptation, the impact on uh, transportation. So let's first take a look at the cause, i.e. the transportation sector uh, as a source of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, if you look at the major sectors in the United States, uh, of which transportation is one, uh, approximately 28% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the United States comes from the transportation sector. And it's rising, uh, which is more importantly that it's continuing to, to provide more and more greenhouse gas emissions as the other sectors such as agriculture, uh, commercial, residential, seems to be declining. So the point is, is from a public policy perspective, if you are a national government, uh, and you're interested in trying to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that are being emitted, you have to look at the transportation sector. It's just one of the big sectors with regard to sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Within the transportation sector, where are the emissions coming from? Well, 82% of the CO2, which is by far the major greenhouse gas emission, 82% comes from light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles. Um, so if in fact you're interested in transportation, then you've got to be interested in what are you going to do about passenger cars, trucks, light duty vehicles, et cetera. Uh, and that is, in essence, where we are focusing our energies uh, in the area of transportation, at least, with regard to climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and transportation. If you look at a broader perspective, not just the United States, but the entire world, um, and what's going to happen worldwide, this particular figure might be frightening, depending on how you, how you identify it. In essence, what this says is that by the year 2050, there will be three times the number of vehicles in the world as there are today. And by far, the major increase is going to be in the developing world, or what's called the non-OECD countries. Um, if those vehicles are, quote, clean, um, and they do not emit greenhouse gas emissions, well, big deal. They will have congestion like we have congestion. Learn from us, but probably won't. If, however, those vehicles are not necessarily clean, this is going to be a huge, huge challenge worldwide with regard to, again, the role that the transportation sector plays uh, with regard to greenhouse gas emissions. Now, there are states uh, and there are scientists and there are governments out there that are saying, we've got to do something about this. Uh, and what this something usually means is we want to set targets. Um, we want to reduce the number of greenhouse gas emissions by the year whatever, 2050, 2040, whatever the case is, to some level below where we were in 1990 or 2000. Okay? So for example, climate scientists suggest that a reasonable target is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 to 80% below where we were in 1990. That's what this means. Okay? Now I'm going to show you some figures in a minute about what this may mean in terms of transportation in particular, and I suspect you'll see how daunting, as I say, this really means in terms of what we have to do. But there are really some very, these are targets that in fact have been talked about nationally and internationally, and again, by some particular states. Um, many states have in fact developed what are called climate action plans, where they've identified specific types of actions that they think should be taken to meet cer certain target values. Uh, you see Kansas is there, uh, at least at the time was in the development of, I think they actually have developed a climate action plan since this particular slide was put in place. <coughs> What's interesting to me about these climate action plans is I say they're all over the map. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is here you see some states, a random sample of states, um, in the year, the target year, and these percentages here in the column say what percent of their reductions are going to come from that particular source. Okay, let's, let's take uh, Connecticut. <coughs> Connecticut, CT. 
51% of the reductions, they say, are going to come from new vehicle technologies that are going to reduce emissions. 38% are going to come from low carbon fuels. I call this, let somebody else solve the problem for us. Okay? The state of Connecticut is not responsible for vehicle technology. They're not responsible for fuels. Somebody out there is going to solve the problem for us. And in order to meet our targets in Connecticut, that means 8% oh, of our reduction is going to come from smart growth, which means denser development, and transit. Okay? That's Connecticut. Look at Maryland. Maryland, MD, 24% from vehicles, 12%. 45% reduction of emissions from smart growth and transit. There is no way in the world that the great state of Maryland is going to have a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from smart growth and transit, and yet that's what they're claiming as part of the plans. So the point here is that there's no consistency whatsoever in terms of what people are pointing to as really as what are the strategies that really will make sense in the context of reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, in the transportation sector, we often talk about a five-legged stool. Um, it started out being a three-legged stool, um, which is a stable plane. Three points make a plane. You should know that if you're engineers, or maybe non-engineers. Uh, then it went to a four-legged stool. We're now up to a five-legged stool, and I'm working on the sixth leg. Okay? Uh, the five-legged stool basically means here are the five major areas where we're going to see potential reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Number one, vehicle technology. Number two, better fuels, less carbon uh, fuels. Number three, let's reduce vehicle miles traveled. VMT stands for vehicle miles traveled. Number four, let's get more efficient utilization out of our existing transportation networks so people aren't delayed, aren't caught in congestion and wasting fuel and emissions and all sorts of good things. And then the fifth leg, which was just recently added last year, is maybe we can get some reductions in, in terms of the construction technologies, the construction strategies, and the maintenance and operations of our transportation system as well. Now, if we look at some of these very quickly, there is no question in my mind, and certainly from others who are probably more knowledgeable than I am with regard to the technology side, that vehicle and fuels are going to be the major source of reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. However, the key message is they are not the panacea. They will not solve all the problems that we have with regard to greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. And I've seen study after study which shows that in essence that that is not going to get what we need to get in terms of reductions. Most people that I've talked to or are specialists in the area believe that a 50% cut in greenhouse gas emissions per mile for vehicles is feasible by 2030 by looking with conventional technologies and looking at alternative fuels. Okay? A decarbonization, which means carbon-free fuels, by 2050 is, quote, realistic, in quotation marks, assuming, in fact, that we have major advances in technology with regard to vehicle engine combustion as well as different types of fuels. And electric and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are promising but they still face significant challenges with regard to both the technology as well as the marketability, i.e. cost, associated with it. So yes, vehicle fuels technology important, but not a panacea. And you've seen some of these before, the different types of fuels. I won't go into them uh, in any way, uh, but you've seen a lot of people uh, advocating one or another or some combination uh, there 